In the United States, the first African American president came out in support of same sex marriage. But on the continent of Africa, things are very dark indeed for members of the LGBT community. Tonight, we speak about one country's reputation with gay rights, specifically Uganda, with our next guest, Lindsay Arisman. Lindsay, welcome. Hi, thank you for having me. So, just how bad? is it to be gay in Uganda? Well, I think it's getting better. Um, it, was, it has been really difficult, obviously, and it's been a long road with the introduction of the homosexual, anti-homosexuality bill. But actually, last year, Ugandans celebrated their first gay pride, which was really exciting. Right. Um, but yeah, there's a long way to go still, obviously. And the bill is still on the table. It hasn't been passed yet, but it's still up for discussion. Right. So, I mean, but leaving aside whatever the legislative environment may be, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't walk down the street of Uganda's capital probably with my husband holding a hand. Certainly not. Yeah. No. It's, it would be dangerous. It would be. And discrimination and hate crimes are very present. Right. Yeah. Now, how did a young straight woman, not African American, <laughs> uh, find herself on the streets of Uganda within the last few weeks? And what exactly is it in your personal life that inspired you to do this trip? I understand you have a, a role model uh, in your own family. Yeah, well, growing up, definitely LGBT rights was a huge topic of discussion. My great aunt, Ina Mae Murray, she was a huge activist in the Bay Area. And she was born into a staunchly conservative Mormon family in southern Idaho in 1935. So you can imagine the kind of struggles that she faced in her lifetime. But um, she moved to San Francisco. She met her partner, Stella, that she was with until her death um, two years ago. Mm -hmm. And she really just fought for other people, helping to found organizations like the Lavender Elders in Fremont. Mm -hmm. um, and so after her death, I just felt compelled to really honor her memory. And I was, at the time, enrolled in an anthropology course, Cross-Cultural Sex and Gender. And I heard for the first time Robert Mugabe's speech, the president of Zimbabwe, from 1995 when he publicly condemned homosexuality for the first time. He was really the first African leader to do this. And what year was that? 1995. Mm -hmm. And um, he said something in the speech that homosexuality was un-African. And I thought that was really an interesting idea and, and where did this idea come from and how did it become popular and so I was exploring that and then in that same year the anti-homosexuality bill was proposed and so I turned to Uganda to look at what was happening because I right. thought that was important. So the trip you took to Uganda was yeah. 10 days and my understanding is it wasn't with a group of people. You didn't have an yeah. escort. You went over as uh, this, yeah. this blonde white thing into a homophobic country. I yeah. mean, I mean what, what did that feel like? Well, you can't, I couldn't really talk about why I was there, what I was uh -huh. researching. Um, but I wasn't, I never felt afraid. Um, it was really safe. I was staying on campus. Um, and what campus and were you staying on? I was, I'm sorry, I was at Makarere University in Kampala. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I actually had a really positive experience, but also eye-opening. I mean, even talking to young people on campus, as soon as anything comes up about gay rights, it's, the conversation ends. So it's not even the discrimination, but it's the act of silencing mm -hmm. of homosexuality that I think is equally dangerous and problematic. So. In your experience and in your study over the last few years at San Francisco State University, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. What you, is the reason for it? I mean, you, President Mugabe said that homosexuality was quote unquote un-African. Right. What did he mean by that? Is it because it's a male dominated culture? Is it religious based? What is the root of the fear and the prejudice within Africa in general right. and Uganda in specific to LGBT issues? Well, I think that it comes from this idea about African tradition and traditional identities that developed over time as a result of colonial influence and also missionary influence. And my research actually focuses on early missionaries and colonizers in Uganda. And there was this idea in Europe that Africans were not capable of being homosexual, quote unquote homosexual. Um, that they were exclusively heterosexual because Africans were linked to 
animals, and they believed animals weren't capable of that, which we also know isn't true. I believe it's now 10% yeah. or right. more of the animal population is also believed to be homosexual. Right, um, and so this was just a part of the popular discourse. It was in a lot of the intellectual work that was being published in the 18th and 19th centuries. And Sir Richard Burton, um, an intellectual in Great Britain, he actually came up with this idea of the sotatic zone, that sexuality was geographically determined and only certain places would, you know, sort of foster this behavior. And among the places that weren't a part of the sotatic zone were sub-Saharan Africa. And by the sotanic zone you mean, and that's what, S-O-T-O-N-I-C? S-O-T-A-D-I-C. I got it. And that sotatic. means an area where no one's gay. No, it means where there are gay there people. There are gay people. Yes. And so he was saying one of the areas that was not that the satanic was Africa. Right. And what was the source of his idea I mean, or his study? That's the really interesting thing. There is no <clears throat> real basis for these kinds of arguments, but I mean, this was at a time when there was a lot of racial thought being intermixed with science and eugenics and, mm -hmm. you know. And slavery was still legal in many countries. Um, slavery had been abolished by the end of the 19th century when mm -hmm. I... When he I was doing his work. Yeah, so, uh -huh. um, but it was st still a very racist sort of time, mm -hmm. and there was a lot of racist thinking, and um, so that definitely had influence. How much impact mm -hmm. does and did the AIDS pandemic have on the present homophobia, or not, I would even say homophobia, but the anti-gayness, quote unquote, of right. Uganda and Africa. Because we all know that the majority, the majority of AIDS, HIV cases right. come not from uh, gay men in the United States, mm -hmm. but heterosexuals uh, in Africa. Well, I think this whole concept of fear about anything, about AIDS, HIV, about homosexuality, it all comes from what's unknown, and that there are these links, but What's interesting is that a lot of people are, you know, blaming homosexuals for the gay epidemic in Africa and around the world, but these facts that they're basing it on are all coming from these uninformed places. Right. Now, you, you talked about the influence of missionaries and religion uh -huh. in Uganda. Yeah. In general, what is the religious makeup of Uganda? So there's three main dominant um, religious groups. So it would be evangelical, Christian, Catholic, and Muslim. And in, in that descending order, so Muslims would be the least? Muslims are the least, but they're actually a pretty significant portion of the population. I think, not a terribly gay-friendly religion. No, uh, none of nor them Nor is are, evangelical Christians. Right. Yeah. But I think evangelical Christians have had the most influence because they've been pouring the most money. And um, also, I think access to information has a lot to do with people's attitudes. Most of the radio stations are fa owned by faith-based organizations. In Uganda. In Uganda. And even um, the main newspaper is state-controlled, state-run. So that, that's a big problem, too, because all of the information people are getting about sexuality and HIV, too, um, comes from these places that have a very, you know, particular point of view right. about those things. W what is the general population's access to what we would call mass media or the internet, the ability to, for instance, see this show or get information right. other than state-controlled or faith-based media? Well, I mean, there is the internet there, definitely, and if you're a student or you have access to a university, then it's easier to get the internet. But even when I was there, it was down all the time. Mm -hmm. It was a little unpredictable when you could use the internet, and not everyone has computers or televisions. Right. It's a smaller country, so radio seems to be the most um, right. popular way of getting information. Now, your trip encompassed 10 days, and you were there traveling alone, but you were in a university. Yeah. What was the university setting like? I mean, would you consider it, um, you know, progressive, liberal? Was it a faith-based institution? It's a public university, but um, it is interesting. There's, I mean, there's a mix of different perspectives and worldviews there. But what I found really interesting is, um, so I don't know if you're familiar with the murder of David Kato. He mm -hmm. was a popular gay activist in Uganda. Um, the newspaper that had published his photograph and address, calling him out as a homosexual, along with, you know, there were a hundred in total, um, was actually a tabloid created by two students from Makarere University, who 
educated, 22 years old. And so I thought that was really interesting. This isn't a generational thing mm -hmm. where the younger people are starting to be more progressive. A lot of this sort of backlash is coming from the youth and so, students. I mean, so that gay activist actually probably began his journey towards his murder because of two 22-year-old students publishing his mm -hmm. picture in a newspaper. Right. Yeah. Now, does that sort of thing still go on in the media in Uganda? Well, there's been so much international pressure to denounce the bill, to not pass the bill, to not, you know, um, condone this kind of behavior towards mm -hmm. um, homosexuals. And so there has been some um, pushback. pushback and, yeah. and what is the state of the bill? What does the bill actually say? Okay. And what is its status right now as we sit here? So it's still in Parliament, but it hasn't been passed. What happened when it was first proposed, there were a few different components of the bill, and one of them um, proposed the death penalty. And this would, death penalty for just if you are accused of being gay, or you have if, to be caught in a sexual act. Well, I mean, they have very specific stipulations, but they're ambiguous enough that they can be interpreted in a few mm -hmm. different ways. But it's if you're a serial offender. Um, Meaning if I've had sex more than once or with more than one person? I think if you've gotten caught more than once uh -huh. having sex with someone of the same right. gender. Um, if you give alcohol to the person you have sex with. Uh -huh. um, if you have HIV. Um, if you have sex with a minor. Uh, I think that is all of it. And that was, that was what could you know, result in the death penalty. Right. The others were um, just for any homosexual act, even activists in Uganda who support homosexuals or don't turn them in could go to jail for up to 14 years. Right. Now, while you were there on your trip during those 10 days, did you actually meet anyone who came out to you as a, a gay person in Uganda? I did not, and I think I would have to really get to know someone and form a trusting relationship before they mm -hmm. reveal that kind of information to me because of the homophobic climate there. Right, but did you suspect? Uh, no, I mean, uh -huh. not necessarily. I was no. <laughs> and do you think when 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 you you said you just kind of casually raised this discussion about the right. bill, do you think someone turned to you and thought, oh, she's gay or whatnot? And, and what was the response? What what did they say when you? raise the issue of homosexuality? What was their response? I think they just thought I was American and that this human rights discourse is such a mm -hmm. you know strong part of right. our... But what did they say? Did they say, oh, it's bad, it's sinful? What was their response Mo to homosexuality in general? The consensus was that they all believed it was a sin, it wasn't right, it mm -hmm. shouldn't be practiced, and it wasn't practiced traditionally. Right. And that these are people in their 20s we're talking about. Of all ages, yeah. Of all ages. Across the now, board. Now, the current president of Uganda, because mm -hmm. ostensibly it's a democracy, correct? Yes. His name? Is Yoweri Museveni. And he has been president since? 1986. Wow, no term limits in that country, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, and, and what's really interesting is that he says that his son um, is the only person who can continue to mm -hmm. um, meet the demands of Ugandan society and so he's really campaigning for his son to take over. When Whenever he, he decides yeah. to leave. Yeah. Now the current bill has all kinds of uh, punishments mm -hmm. for homosexuality mm -hmm. but you said that they're trying to get rid of the stipulation that if I'm in bed with my husband I can actually get executed. Yes, yeah, so after so much international pressure was put on um, the Ugandan parliament they did revise the bill and they took the death penalty component out of it and so now I mean it's life imprisonment which you know. Life imprisonment, yes. that's all. Yeah. Um, are there African countries that are worse as far as uh, uh, gay rights or human rights in Uganda at the moment? Well none of the other countries have um, proposed the death penalty yet mm -hmm. so I don't think so but I mean it's pretty ubiquitous throughout mm -hmm. sub-Saharan Africa, this idea. Do you feel that what is going on in Uganda is in endemic of a more conservative trend or the beginning of the end of a conservative trend? I mean, the fact that it's been even raised a as an issue, is this kind of like the last gasp of institutionalized homophobia, or do you think we're going to start seeing a wave of legislation, uh, anti-gay homophobic legislation throughout Africa? In your, in, you know, in your view and as a historian. Well, I want to be optimistic. Right. I do. But um, be realistic. But, I mean, I think it's going to come down to, sadly, who's 
putting more money in to the countries because right now missionaries are pouring a lot of money but so are human rights organizations right, and right. so it it's just depends on who can benefit the most right. sadly and I also understand that some of these laws aren't really African generated they right. are the legacy of British colonialism mainly um, during the colonial period there was common law British right. common law and anti-sodomy laws were a part of that since 1861 right. so um, what happened after independence Uganda became independent in 1962 but even after independence a lot of the laws stayed on the book so these you know laws aren't necessarily new they're just looking to sort right. of broaden them and make mm -hmm. them stricter in our last few seconds if someone is interested in learning more about Uganda, where can they go if they want to help, if they want to learn how to help gay activists in Uganda or just educate right. themselves? But where can they go? Um, there's a great organization in Uganda called SMUG, and it's Sexual Minorities Uganda, and that's actually where David Kato is working. Um, and it's, it's a really great resource, and that would be the first place that I would look. Thanks very much. Thank you. We've been speaking with historian Lindsay Erisman about the current state of the LGBT community in Uganda. Next up, we meet a cast member from Sex and the City, Drag Style. We'll be right back.